Hey, what's up you guys? Welcome back to Andy's Book Club. So as you guys probably already noticed, I took a little bit of a hiatus. However, now I am back and now I'm ready to pick up where we left off, which uh, we were in the middle of covering The Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell. Uh, and we left off at chapter three, which was uh, the stickiness factor. Uh, so this is the uh, chapter that we're going to cover in today's episode. Uh, and the overall kind of story of this chapter is we're going to explore how Sesame Street, the popular children's show, uh, became so successful. Uh, we're also going to talk about a lot of other examples that Gladwell gave uh, in this book about how uh, some little change was made that made a message all that more sticky and all that more powerful. Uh, first of all, I want you guys to remember and keep in the back of your head uh, of the central message of this chapter, which is the message itself matters, but also the way that is presented. Uh, as in the principle that lies in the heart of stickiness is the way that uh, the message is presented. And it could be little tiny things that make all the difference. And that's, of course, the overall uh, kind of theme of the book. So the first example uh, that we have to go through is Lester Wonderman, who is a uh, person that was in charge of the marketing campaign at this record uh, company. So uh, this was back in the 70s. So this was before we had uh, MP3 uh, players and all that digital music kind of stuff. Uh, so this was back in the day where if you wanted to listen to music, you had to order these like vinyl records. Uh, and basically, uh, they would mail you a catalog and you would tick off a form of what you would uh, want to buy and then you would mail them back the form with the money uh, and then they will mail you back uh, the whatever you ordered. Uh, so uh, Wonderman was in charge of advertising at this uh, record company. So he made up this game called the Gold Box Treasure Hunt, uh, which in the uh, TV Guide and Parade, which was the catalog's name, uh, whenever there's an ad uh, for his company, he would put a little gold box. And the goal of the customer is to find this gold box, you put in uh, a record that you really like, and then you mail it back. Uh, and then you would get, there was some promotion, so you would get that record for free, or there would be some other uh, type of uh, benefit for you if you did that. Uh, so uh, what he did was, instead of just a boring ad, where it's a transactional kind of relationship, right? You see the ad, and then you're like, I don't know if I wanna buy it or not. Uh, he made that into a game. Uh, so this is kind of the goal of advertisers all around is how do you get more engagement from your audience, right? And you can, uh, one way to do that is to make it into a game, to make it uh, more than just transactional, to make the audience feel like they're invested in that product uh, or in that service. Uh, so it could be a YouTube video as well, right? So for example, this YouTube video, uh, let me ask you the question, what is an example of a real life example that happened to you where you feel like uh, because you were interacting with the company that made the product, uh, did it make you more uh, involved or did it make you more passionate or did it make you like the product more, right? So can you name a real life example of something potentially like a gold box treasure hunt that you experienced? in your life. Uh, so that's the question. Leave them down in the comments below. Leave your answers. Uh, the next uh, example is what's called the tetanus pamphlet. So tetanus is a disease, right? So it was the school that wanted people to, wanted their students to get the tetanus shot so that they don't suffer from this disease. Uh, but the issue was that they, the vaccination rate was really low, right? So it was around 3%. Uh, and they were trying to figure out what they did wrong. Uh, so uh, the pamphlet had all the information that you needed uh, about the dangers of, of uh, you know, getting the disease uh, so, and how vaccination will prevent it. Uh, but they found that even though they did a study of like students where they gave the pamphlet and they were like, okay, did it scare you enough? Uh, did it motivate you to get the shot? Uh, and then they were all like, yes, it, it really scares me and I think I should get the shot. However, uh, it didn't reflect into real life results, right? The vaccination rate, as I said, was only 3%. Um, but in the next iteration, they discovered what went wrong. So in the next iteration, uh, they included a campus map of the clinic uh, of where you can get the vaccination, the, the shot. So once they made that change, uh, the vaccination all of a sudden rose from 3% to 28%. 
Uh, so the issue wasn't that the message wasn't scary enough or the message was bad or people didn't understand the message. It was that people didn't know where to go to get the shot. So j it's just something like really stupid and really obvious maybe. Uh, but it's just when they made that change, the vaccination skyrocketed. So uh, yeah, that's an example of how little things can make a huge difference. Uh, now let's circle back and talk about Sesame Street, which was the biggest example of this chapter. Uh, and, uh, you know, when you start off thinking about TV shows and how to gain, uh, especially children's attention or how to retain a child's uh, attention throughout a TV show, uh, you think that, you know, TV uses a lot of flashing lights and bright colors to hold somebody's attention. Uh, but at the end of the day, when they did the study, it realized that they realized that uh, it still needed to make sense. So even if you're making a TV show for a kid, uh, the storyline, they were still, they still got to be able to piece that together. Uh, so what they did for the uh, creators of the Sesame Street show was that they made this thing called the distractor. So basically it was a, a slideshow that played along beside uh, the TV. Uh, so uh, they would pilot an episode of Sesame Street and have it playing. Uh, and then they would have the distractor on right beside it. And then the slideshow would be like, I don't know, pink flamingos or like waterfalls or rainbows. Uh, just whatever was the most distracting thing to a kid that you can think of. Uh, and they would measure how many times the kid would look away from the TV and onto the distractor. So if the kid wasn't paying attention or if they didn't understand what was going on on the TV, they would, of course, uh, be distracted and look at the distractor. And they wanted to... Uh, have a high retention rate means that uh, like when the distractor was playing beside the TV, the kid was still focused on the TV. Uh, so that's the goal anyways, and that's how they measure success. Uh, so they made this show, uh, they made this one episode called Oscars Blending, which I believe was uh, trying to teach kids about learning words and learning how to piece letters together. Uh, but what they discovered was that, yes, it was very good at retaining a kid's uh, attention. So the kid was able to look at the TV and not get distracted by the slideshow uh, in, that was right beside it. However, uh, they didn't understand the message because the message itself uh, was too complex, right? So uh, they didn't learn how to... Uh, whatever lesson that was trying to be taught, which was, you know, something about words and piecing letters together and things like that. Uh, so that's another thing that I got to watch out for is that if you make a message sticky, you got to make sure that it also uh, sticks at where you want to stick, which means that, oh yeah, let me phrase this a little bit better. It's like a message can be sticky in multiple ways. Uh, so in this case, they made Oscar the character sticky, means that the kids was uh, the kids were looking at Oscar all the time, but they weren't understanding the lesson that was going on in the background, which was the whole point of the adults who are making the show uh, all along. Uh, so you also got to watch out that uh, when you make a message sticky, you want the right thing to stick. Uh, so that's that. Uh, the next episode that they tried was uh, Big Bird. Uh, so. This one episode, they had Big Bird trying to find a new name because uh, Big Bird didn't like the premises that Big Bird didn't like the name Big Bird. Uh, but that episode was an absolute failure because it was too complex. Uh, so the children did not understand how something could have two different names. Like for adults, uh, we know that an oak tree is still a tree. So if I say there's an oak in my backyard, uh, you would understand it being, oh, there's an oak tree in my backyard. Uh, but for a kid, uh, I just called it an oak, but then I also called it a tree. So which is it? Is it an oak or is it a tree? So a kid doesn't really, when they're that young, uh, they don't understand how there could be two different names for a single object. So this was where the episode went wrong, where uh, Big Bird was trying to find a new name, but all the kids knew, knew Big Bird as Big Bird. So it's like, it doesn't make sense, right? How could you be someone else? Um, so that's also another important thing that you got to keep in mind to make a message sticky is that you have to very like a hundred percent ensure that the audience doesn't find your concept that you're trying to convey too complex or else they're, it's not going to stick. Uh, so the last thing that's talked about in this chapter is a show called Blue's Clues. Uh, 
so uh, Blue's Clues was actually a show that I watched when I was young, so I remember this show uh, very clearly. Uh, so Blue's Clues, the premise is that there's this guy named Steve and his dog Blue, uh, and his dog Blue would uh, give him hints as to, uh, would try to communicate with him, but uh, the Blue Blue can't talk, right, because he's a dog, so he puts his paw print on random things, and then uh, the whole show, you collect these clues, uh, and then at the end of the show, you have to guess what Blue is trying to say. Uh, so, for example, uh, the one of the, the one of, one of the clues was ice, and then next with waddle, and then next with black and white. So those were the three clues, and you have to try and piece them together. Uh, and if you guessed it, the right answer was penguin. So that's what uh, trying to what Blue was trying to say, but. What they discovered was that the order of the clues presented matters. So that was one way that you could present the clues, as I just said, uh, which was ice, waddle, black and white. Uh, but that's actually not the best order as they discovered uh, at a later time, because uh, what you could do is present them in the order of black and white, ice and waddle. And one of these works better than the other at audience retention. The latter one worked, the second one worked better uh, at audience retention. And this is because black and white is kind of like a general concept versus if you start off with ice, it's a very specific thing. So you want to go from a broad concept and narrow it down to a specific concept. Uh, and the reason why you want to do that is you keep the suspense all the way uh, till the end. So if you uh, present them in a random order or in a in the suboptimal order, then it confuses the kids, right? So this, remember, we're talking about kids here. This is a kids show. Uh, so you really got to make things uh, very intuitive. Uh, and the most intuitive way is to start off with black and white because a lot of things are black and white. So it keeps uh, people guessing. Uh, and the kids try to like narrow it down as the show goes on. Uh, so this is another essence of finding uh, a message that sticks, which is to uh, present your message in an order that is understandable. Uh, and that's another very important part of today's story. And yeah, essentially that's it for this chapter. Uh, the whole point is that you got to find those one or two small things that make a message stick, uh, and that will make your message irresistible. Uh, so we'll pick up next week in chapter four, which is called The Power of Context. Uh, so I'll see you guys next week. Thank you for watching. Thank you.